Hello everyone and welcome to the latest edition of Zags A Push from the Underground Garage. Today is a special day. We are in period seven. We're continuing discussions in period seven and today we're going to be targeting the Great Depression, really looking at the decade of the 1930s. So we're going to look at the causes of the Great Depression. We're going to look at the impact of the Great Depression on various social groups, as well as the response to the Great Depression from the presidential administrations of Hoover and FDR. So sit back, relax, get yourself a Ticonderoga, and let's get ready to rock and roll. They used to tell me I was building a dream, and so I followed the mob. When there was earth to plow. Let's begin. The 1920s was a decade defined with economic prosperity. The role of women was beginning to change, especially with suffrage solidified 18th Amendment. And an overall clash of cultures was taking place between the traditionalists who sought to re return to normalcy, return to normalcy, and the modernists who began questioning traditional thoughts of science, technology, and really where the United States stands in the world. In addition, the government under Harding and Coolidge fostered the laissez-faire economic policies that were fueling the nation. These political, economic, and social elements were creating an economic bubble that was about to burst. The end of the decade would usher in the worst financial crisis the nation has ever seen, and the political response under FDR in the 1930s would forever change the role of government and the presidency in the United States. The economic prosperity of the 20s was fueled by consumer production of goods. The spending on consumer products was at an all-time high. Major companies like uh, General Electric and Ford, uh, became, which became corporations during the rise of the big business of the Gilded Age, were now becoming household names. In addition, business and people alike began trading on the stock market. The use of credit became a new way for people to purchase items that they could not afford in a one lump sum, but could afford through payments and over time. Furthermore, people were using the same concepts in buying stock. People would purchase stock on margin, meaning they would put down a percentage of the stock and pay off their debt with the dividends or profit from the stock. This was a cycle that would form an economic bubble that would eventually burst. With stock speculation running rampant, overproduction became another economic issue of the time period. This would be in the consumer goods as well as for the farmers in the Midwest. Farmers in the Midwest, while having fantastic harvests in the 1920s, once again suffered from the post-war overproduction lower wheat price lower wheat prices and mounds of debt from purchasing new mechanized equipment like tractors combines etc to recap excessive use of credit overproduction of and stock speculation as well as we have to factor in here the uneven distribution of wealth combined with a government that let business run unregulated remember these are the rollbacks of the progressive era under the um, Harding and Coolidge administrations and back to that return to normalcy ideology created a new stew that would boil over with the stock market collapse of October 29, 1929. The crash of 29 would usher in a new decade and the worst depression the nation has ever encountered. But why are we calling this the Great Depression? Why isn't it just another panic or a recession? The U.S. had gone through economic crisis before and has always chalked it up to the price of doing business. It's our way. It's our capitalism. It's going to have booms and busts. But this depression was different. It lasted longer, caused more businesses and banks to go out, and unemployment rose to a staggering 25% in the 30s. In addition, the crisis also impacted more people across class lines and in the end, it would take 12 years, two presidents, and a world war to get out of. And when we talked about here, the crisis was moving across, um, across uh, class lines. We really need to focus on the middle class. They were the ones that were getting hit the hardest during this economic crisis. What we're seeing here is with the middle class, once that... Once the calamity, once the bubble bursts, the, the middle class has developed... Um, 
during the Gilded Age. Remember the middle classes consisting of farmers, excuse me, not farmers, no, not farmers. The middle classes consisting of teachers, lawyers, doctors, as well as um, managerial positions and clerks and engineers that are now in these new major industries in the cities. So they have developed a, an economic cushion, so to speak, that is allowing them to, to become accustomed to a better quality of life. Now, when the depression hits, the working poor, it didn't matter before the depression or after the depression, the working poor is the working poor. They have been hit hard before and they were always going to be poor. The upper class, the rich, the extreme wealth, if you know they're worth $12 million and they lose $2 million as a result of the depression, they're still going to be able to put food on their table. But it's the middle class that came of, uh, that has become accustomed to this lifestyle that is going to really be hit the hardest during the time period. They used to tell me I was building a dream. There was earth to plow or guns to bear. I was always there right on the job. Now we're going to look at the Hoover years of the Depression. The assessment of Hoover and his lack of political intervention is not really fair to blame. Hoover's actions were status quo of the time period. The role of government was not to interfere with business, although all executives, and meaning the president and the government, always had a place in the economic policy of the United States, dating back to Hamilton and tariffs and etc. But for this crisis, Hoover, like many others, did not realize how much the U.S. economy had grown and how much the government actually needed to interfere with such a tremendous loss of economic wealth for the nation. Hoover believed in rugged individualism. And he quote, and I quote, I do not believe that the power and duty of the general government ought to be extended to the relief of the individual suffering. The lesson should be constantly enforced that though the people support the government, the government should not support the people. Close quote. With Hoover's attitude toward the role of government being a reflection of the conservative time, he did, however, with the, the, the influence of Congress, begin to um, create and um, take steps in government intervention. But the key word here is ask. He asked business not to cut wages. He asked labor leaders to refrain from strikes. And he really... Uh, look to help he felt that it was really the role of private charities and really su uh, to support the needy he felt that it was the private cha charities sphere to help the needy he hesitated to ask ask congress uh, for any types of legislation and again he sees this as a state responsibility he feels that the state and local government government excuse me have a pulse for what the people need he believes in a partnership with the federal and state governments, but not an equal partnership. He feels that the, the United States, the government, the federal government could make recommendations, but in the end, it would be the states need to decide for their own what they feel would be best to help their people. He did believe, he did not believe, excuse me, in a welfare state. The 1930 midterm election would prove to be the pulse of the people and Hoover's belief in inaction now proved to not be the answer to the question. The people spoke in the midterms and Republicans lost a substantial amount of seats, 52 seat, seats in the House and eight seats in the Senate. But in 1932, just before these midterms, he tried to um, ish, uh, issue a a bailout of some sort on big business. So he's trying to help big businesses. And this is, again, we're going to see a conservative viewpoint here, um, a more Republican viewpoint, where he's going to try to support big businesses from the top. And hopefully that support would then trickle down to their workers and, and support staff, etc. that will then help everybody. So he's looking to cut from the top and hopefully it'll trickle down to the bottom, which we're going to see the opposite approach from FDR come after the 32 election. The national view of Hoover was symbolized in shanty towns that appeared of those whom lost their homes and without action from Hoover were nicknamed Hoovervilles. Yet, it was the bonus army march by World War I veterans looking for the bonuses promised to them from the federal government that would be the straw 
that broke Hoover's back. When the two were when two were killed in the march, Hoover ordered the army to break up the protest. The army rolled in with tanks and gas under the command of Douglas MacArthur and George Patton. We'll talk about them when we do the 1940s. A little foreshadowing here, folks. By this action, the Americans' response again seemed Hoover as heartless and inactive. Again, these are veterans that were looking to have payment from their veterans pay from fighting in the First World War, where they were attacked by German tanks, where they were attacked by gas. So now that they're being attacked um, by this on the home front, it's really going to to put Hoover in this light of inaction. And again, like I said in the beginning, it's not really a fair assessment of Hoover himself on this, this lack of action by him and the federal government. This was status quo of the time period. And moreover, he truly, truly believed in this. Um, you know, Hoover's background is he actually was part of the, the Food Relief Society of Europe Um during World War I, especially with Belgians and parts of France, where he was helping the relief efforts in World War I as, uh, of like almost as like, you know, part of that helping people that couldn't help themselves. Um, but he really felt that the Americans were part of this rugged individualism, that it was self-help and that he, he truly believed in that. And, you know, he's going to be exiled basically after the 32 election um he's going to offer roosevelt to come in after fdr wins the 32 election during his lame duck presidency they to to get started in helping the people um which is not going to happen and roosevelt basically denounces anything that hoover does and and you know it's not till actually after world war ii that truman offers an olive branch to to hoover to to, to take his advice on helping feed and rebuild europe after the um, after the Second World War, so really the assessment of Hoover, yes, there is an active. Um, he, he's not really having what I call like the pulse of the people, what the people need, and he doesn't. You know, the government doesn't read this crisis right. You know, they're thinking that it's just another recession. They they're thinking that it's just another panic, and that eventually it's the price of doing business. It's going to have booms and busts, but they do not understand how much the U.S. economy has grown and how much. Uh, the government does need to actually step in and help. The economic collapse after the 29 crash was not isolated to the cities and industry. In fact, farmers arguably could have been the worst hit. Similar to the recession of the 1890s, farmers were in the vicious cycle of debt, inconsistent crop prices, and the banks the same cycle that influenced the populist party to fight for the rights of the farmer. The 1920s saw the same inconsistencies. The Great War put the Great Plains on the map for the for wheat farming, with Germany cutting off the supply line to Western Europe from the wheat producing nations of Eastern Europe, i.e. the Ukraine and Russia, the Allies turned to the United States. The United States began feeding the nations that were decimated by the German advances, most notably France and France and Belgium. When the U.S. entered the war in 1917, Wilson appointed a food administrator to spearhead a relief effort to Europe. Ironically, he appointed Herbert Hoover. Hoover would become known for his administration and relief efforts of American wheat to the European warring nations. Ironically, his persona during his presidency would not be so angelic. He would be deemed heartless and ineffective for his lack of governmental action during the early years of the Depression. Great Plains became the breadbasket of America and the world. In order to cultivate plants, man must disturb the upper or surface soil by tilling the native buffalo grass. By stirring the soil, man accelerates the normal geological weathering that has been going on for ages under normal conditions. John Ash from Folkways. The Plow That Broke the Plains was a documentary produced by the government to show the change from farming into the agribusiness. Think Jeffersonian farming ideology with a Hamilton business mind. The agribusiness took new technologies of motorized tractors and farm equipment, coupled with the disc plow and tilled through the native grass holding the plants together. In 1890, there were 5,700 farmers with an average size of 250 acres. By 1910, there were 11,400 farms with an average size of 813 acres. The rolling hills and pastures transitioned into an Olympus of wheat and agri 
business. 1920 saw booms and busts for farmers. The crop was great. The weather fostered beautiful crop production, but the overproduction of the crop saw prices plummet. To make do, farmers tilled more land to break even. The farmers, like stock speculators in the East, were gambling. While they did not gamble with the stock options, they did gamble, however, with buying on credit as well as gambling on the weather. The Great Plains, most notably the Lower Plains, Oklahoma, Colorado, New Mexico, and parts of West Texas, were prone to drought. While the 20s was booming for growing conditions, the 30s saw the bust. The Dust Bowl was a natural disaster manufactured by humans, Lou Major. While the drought was a natural phenomenon, the degrading of the grass prairie, coupled with drought, wind, and intense heat, turned the region into a dust bowl. Some of the hardest hit areas were the lower plains, parts of, like I said previously, West Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, and the Oklahoma Panhandle saw farms destroyed, as well as an influx of sickness as a result of the dust particles. People lost everything, farms, livestock, their livelihood. To some, the loss was so great that they packed everything onto their car and moved west. Okies, as they were called, were moving west, their own manifest destiny, but rather than looking for riches in the gold fields, they were looking for a new start. Today we would call them refugees. These dust storms became so frequent from 14 a year to over 30 that the static electricity that they produced would force people to refrain from shaking hands. In addition, some of these storms would kick up dust as high as 10,000 feet and would reach cities like Chicago, Cleveland, and even as far east as New York and Boston before settling out to sea. The nation now not only dealing with an economic disaster, was dealing with a natural disaster to boot. Like Jacob Reese during the Progressive Era, using his photographs to show the nation how the other half lived, Dorothea Lange did the same with her famous photo titled Migrant Mother, 1936. Her eyes tell the story of the Dust Bowl. In addition, John Steinbeck wrote The Grapes of Wrath, a telling story of the Joad family that was looking for the promised land. Musical artists like Woody Guthrie wrote many songs that reflected the social impact of the dust storms that would culminate in the album entitled Dust Bowl Ballads. With FDR's promise of a new deal, aid was coming to the farmers. New Deal programs created to support farmers included the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the AAA, and that would pay farmers to limit their crop production. In addition, the Farm Credit Administration offered loans to farmers. The FDR administration also began environmental legislations to mitigate the root, pun intended, of the problem. Most notably, the Soil Erosion Service and the Soil Conservation Association provided funding to reduce the stress and rehabilitation of erosion. The Dust Bowl was another example of the pain and heartache Americans were going through during the 1930s. Happy days are here again, the skies above are clear again. The election in 1932 saw Democrat Franklin Delano Roosevelt against the incumbent president Herbert Hoover. It wasn't even a close race. At the Democratic National Convention in July of 32, Franklin Roosevelt had resolved, and I quote, resume the country's interrupted march along the path of real progress, of real justice, or real quality for all our citizens, great and small, close quote. FDR saw the challenges of the Depression as a battle, and like his fifth cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, he wanted a deal, square deal for Teddy, that would give the greatest good to the greatest number of citizens. Remember, Teddy Roosevelt's square deal, he felt that he didn't want to destroy capitalism, but he wanted to do was make it equitable for everybody. Although African Americans during what will become Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal would be marginalized as well as women, um, but we will see some gains and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, FDR is elected in, 19, in November 1932, and he's inaugurated in 1933, and he has these words to say with his first inaugural address. This is a day of national consecration, and I am certain 
that on this day my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and a decision which the present situation of our people impels. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. After the inauguration, FDR got to work right away. Roosevelt had a Democratic Congress to work with and used the power of the radio to help bring a calm to the storm. The fireside chats, as he called them, would explain to the American people how the government was working for them. He wanted to bring a sense of calm to the American people to show that he was going to be doing something, whereas Herbert Hoover was taking more of that laissez-faire approach like um, his past predecessors as well as many conservatives during the era. Um, we see this to some extent today with what President Biden is doing with Twitter. Uh, he's giving daily tweets as a um, as a as a as as a um, vessel for information to the American people, to telling him what he's doing, what changes he's making, and and who he's what he's working to do. You know, during his first hundred days, and we see that clearly that. Uh, Biden admires FDR as he chose FDR to uh, uh, be one of the portraits that is hanging in the Oval Office. So the fireside chat of the early 20th century with the use of the power of the radio is very similar and the same concept as what presidents today are using um, Twitter for, uh, a way to reach the people. He wanted to show transparency. FDR wanted to show transparency and have the American people know that the government was there to help. He wanted Americans to have a sense of comfort with him and his administration. Moreover, this was the sense of populism in effect. He was using the latest technology to reach the masses and gain support for not only his legislation, but for him as well. This was a complete 180 from the Hoover administration, who felt it was not the government's responsibility to support the people. FDR would distant and nearly exile Hoover from any public office. And we'll see Hoover come back into um, a more back-channel way during the Truman administration. But FDR really, he disliked Hoover and he wanted to distance himself as much as possible from Hoover. And this is what we see is like, you know, towards the, the negative aspects of FDR that we'll talk about later. Um, the way he treated Republicans in general and, and the way that he wanted to get his pieces of legislation across. So FDR introduced the New Deal. So his fifth cousin, Teddy, had the square deal, and now Franklin is having the New Deal. And he says, and I quote, I pledge you, I pledge myself to a New Deal for the American people, close quote. The New Deal was the basis of the FDR domestic policy and his weapon in the battle against the Depression. While at first he would try and balance the federal budget, by 1938, he adopted the pump priming theory to help stimulate the economy. This, in essence, is helping the bottom, the bottom class, the poorer people, and eventually support would rise to the top. This differed from Hoover, where Hoover felt supporting the top would eventually trickle down to the bottom. FDR and his New Deal would introduce the three R's, and these are relief, recovery, and reform. Relief was to help the people who were out of work. Recovery was to help businesses and the economy. And reform was to put measures in place so that a depression of this size does not happen again. The New Deal would be, part, will be put out in two main phases. The first two years of this term, 1933 and 34, would concentrate on relief. The second two years of his first term would focus on recovery and reform. But again, these are all interchangeable throughout his terms of office. FDR used his first 100 days to call a special session of Congress in and began passing his what they called alphabet soup legislation. This would set the tone and his legacy of governmental actions in the daily lives of the people and the economy. So now we're starting to see a shift. We're seeing that shift from that conservative where the, the government was not forcing anybody to do anything. They were not really involved in the daily lives and daily aspects of the American people. But now we're seeing the government take a much more intrusive role into, into people's lives. 
Moreover, the notion of the first 100 days is a precedent set by FDR that other presidents um, used to enact their ideology and their agenda. So it's a barometer. It's a, it's, a, it's a litmus test, so to speak, of what a president can get done in his, and I guarantee you will see a female president in the near future, um, first 100 days of office. So it really is a test that was, that was started by FDR. The early years of the New Deal saw, um, saw concentrations on aid directly to the American people. Again, this ideal, this ideal of relief, as well as to help trying to reform the banking system. The banking system had, had, had totally diminished, and by 1933, he's going to declare, FDR is going to declare a bank holiday. The banks suffered from the bank runs, where people would run to the bank to pull out their money. Once the banks ran out of cash, they would go under, and a uh, Hundreds and thousands of banks went out of business during this time. Uh, he used his, uh, FDR used his fireside chats to explain and justify his decisions on declaring a bank holiday as a time for the government to reorganize the banking system in the nation. To organize and reform the banking, he enacted the FDIC as his biggest piece of uh, the alphabet soup, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the HOLC as well as helping hands to farmers with the Farm Credit Administration. Um, the FDIC is still uh, a very big part of our banking system today, where if you deposit money in it, you are guaranteed uh, a certain number. All right. So if the bank went out of business, the federal government is ensuring it's, uh, that that bank's investors, that bank's clients, a certain number. I believe it's $200,000 today, but I, I would have to double check on that. In addition to the bank holiday, his alphabet soup legislation that concentrated on relief for American people. This included the Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC, the Tennessee Valley Asso and the Tennessee Valley Association, the TVA. So these are two really big and popular pieces of his New Deal. These were jobs for young men to work in a military-style setting in creating infrastructure like the TVA, which brought electricity to the rural South. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to modernize the Deep South, okay? By 1930, you had roughly 65% of America um, being electrified, and that's only going to go up now with harnessing the waterways of the Tennessee River and, and building dams and infrastructure to create hydroelectricity. And again, by creating high, by by electrifying these people, you're then going to be stimulating a, the economy. These people are now going to be working. They're going to be they have electricity in their house, so now they can buy consumer goods, um, consumer appliances, and try and that whole idea of pump priming to to stimulate the economy from the bottom up. While the programs put money in the pockets of young men to send home, it also kept them off the streets, thus re reducing the threat of crime, like we saw in those Hoovervilles during the Hoover administration, where people that were out of work and, and were defaulting on their mortgages and became homeless created these shanty towns, and they were just uh, trickled with crime. Recovery during the era would also include an alphabet soup agency such as the AAA, and the NRA, which targeted in bringing businesses and corporations back online. The AAA targeted farmers, and the NRA concentrated on business and labor. What would they would call the second New Deal, this was the second half of his first term, continued with relief efforts, but on a much larger scale the largest being the Works Progress Authority, the WPA. These jobs paid more than previous relief jobs, not as much as regular work would be, but still more than the original um, 100 days uh, push out, and built and concentrated on infrastructure as well as public entities. Locally, we see this. We see a lot of um, New Deal projects here on Long Island. Uh, Bethpage State Park, including all five golf courses, were products of the WPA. So without the WPA, we don't have Tiger Woods winning that U.S. Open in 2002, okay, at Beth Page Black, one of the most renowned public golf courses in the country, and that was built by the WPA. One of the most popular reforms of the era that is still in use today is the Social Security Act. This act was passed in 1935 and was a federal insurance program in helping people who were of retirement age. In theory, the working generations would, uh, would have withholdings from their salary and would pay for the previous generation who is now retired. So basically, 
the way this would break down is that I'm working now. So my social security money that is being pulled out of my paycheck is now going to pay for people of my parents' age, that baby boomer generation that is retiring and that are in their 70s. And then you'll pay for me when I retire from your social security withholdings. This was also used as unemployment insurance for uh, workers that lost their jobs. Now, like anything else, we still have this time. This is the first time that we're seeing a lot of government interaction in the economy and in people's daily lives where the government, where people are relying on the government. We're having to some extent a, uh, a quasi welfare state. We are, we're having a limited welfare state here with this government control. And of course, this is gonna, there's gonna be tons of opponents to this. This is not gonna go unscathed. Although FDR did have his support in Congress and they basically gave him free reign to do whatever he wanted, there are still gonna be opponents to this that are knocking this as socialism. And because remember, this is the 1930s, so you're starting to see uh, the Soviet Union and, and the rise of communism. You're seeing, um, and then plus you're seeing the rise of fascism in, in Europe with Nazi Germany and in Italy during this time period. Plus you have the Spanish Civil War. So you have all of these different things that we'll talk about next video with our foreign policy. But still, that fear of radical forms of government were, were hindering um, the FDR and, and putting, like, to some extent, some fear in people. So, like other major governmental initiatives, the New Deal came with its critics. FDR was more of a populist president than a unifying president when it came to his critics. Remember we talked about that? This is similar to the 1890s and William Jennings Bryan and what is a populist? Okay, we see what is a populist. It's more of us against them. It's the agrarian notion versus the urban notion. Um, and FDR was no different when, when he publicly spoke and he attacked his crit, uh, attacked his critics, like when he would refer to Republicans as the enemy, and even pushed a to realign the Supreme Court. He wanted to push to realign the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court was finding some of his um, actions uh, unconstitutional. So he called this his court, they, this was known as the court packing scheme, where he would look to replace aging judges that were more on the conservative line with more uh, judges that were aligned with his agenda. Um, and he wanted to make sure that this New Deal legislation he would wanted to ensure it was not blocked or deemed unconstitutional like the, the AAA was uh, in 1936. Uh, this, so, this ultimately was stalled and, and never really enacted. The critics of FDR would reflect the ideology of populists of the 1890s. Remember, populists were a group formed out of frustration to the lack of government intervention during the economic crisis of the 1890s. So we saw that major depression of 1893 that hit the nation. Uh, you know, they called it a panic. They called it a re recession of 1893. But again, you know, we're calling this the Great Depression because of such how much the economy has grown from the 1890s through the 1920s. Um, so again, we see this, this notion for farmers and we see this notion for uh, the, 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 the lower class is saying that the government's not doing enough for them. Clearly, the idea of populism had not faded away and, in fact, are coming in in full force during the latter part of the 1930s. So you have two of the most vocal critics of FDR were Huey Long and Father Charles Coughlin. Uh, they felt that FDR was not liberal enough with his New Deal legislation. Long, a Southerner from Louisiana, was a fiery senator who supported FDR in 32, but broke with him feeling his New Deal was geared to protect and defend capitalism. Again, this idea that he wanted to, that he was not liberal enough and that he was defending big business. Long was reminiscent of the fiery rhetoric from populists, politician like William Jennings Bryan. He's got that fiery voice um, and, and, and a way of, of reaching to the people. Law, um, Coughlin was one of the most, one of uh, FDR's most outspoken critics and one of the most popular voices on the radio during his time period. He had a show called The Golden Hour of the Shrine of the Little Flower, and that had over 16 million listeners. So he had a radio voice that was really pushing out. Uh, he was hailing from the upper Midwest and Coughlin blamed the banks on the depression and looked 
to FDR to nationalize them as well as to inflate currency. So again, similar to this populist ideology of inflating currency like what they wanted to do in the 1890s with the bimetallism. In addition, he used a paranoid style way of broadcasting his radio programs to voice his public advice. Uh, once World War II began, he would be silenced, giving anti-Semitic remarks on why the banks were uh, failing. While the populist train of critics was not doing enough, uh, that FDR was not doing enough, the conservative leg of the battle was not silent, but not as vocal as the liberal opposition. The argument made by conservatives was dealing with Roosevelt centralizing the government. Conservatives felt that centralizing authority was an attack on civil liberties and states' rights. So, yes, this is the same debate that has been going on since the ratification of the Constitution. Fueling the fear of a centralized government was the rise of communism after the Russian Revolution and America's first Red Scare in the 1920s. Don't worry, there'll be another Red Scare in the 50s. So this fear of the centralized power that an FDR is going to go through four terms of office. So his critics, the, the, the more conservative agenda, is going to be fearful because of, again, what's happening in Europe. You see the rise of dictatorships and totalitarianism happening. And even with our ally during World War II, Soviet Union, and they're an ally out of necessity, not an ally out of common ideology. But... um. You know, that fear is there of, of a strong, overreaching government. This is the first time in history that we see a president really taking center stage and increasing the role and power of the federal government. So like Teddy Roosevelt, his fifth cousin did in the 20th, in the start of the 20th century, and then we saw the progressive presidents of Taft and Wilson, but then we went back into a more conservative return to normalcy, and now we're even more expansion of government during the New Deal. So he's taken that progressive ideology, but expanding it, okay? He's expanding the role of government, and this is what we're going to talk about in a little bit, about why FDR, in my opinion, is one of the three revolutionary presidents. So if the liberals felt that he was not centralizing the government enough, and the conservatives felt that he was centralizing the government too much, well, then that puts him right down the middle. So that, in you know, that I would argue is that... FDR is doing the right job here by he's connecting with the liberal agenda, but they're saying he's not liberal enough. So he's connecting with the left. He's expanding the role of the federal government. He's expanding governmental intervention into the economy. He's um, putting people to work on the government milk on the government uh, bill, and he's creating a, a, a welfare state to some extent. But then he's still protecting the capitalistic ideology of free market and private enterprise and private banking um, to, to appease the conservatives, although they're going to say he's not conservative enough, so that's putting him right down the middle. Um, we're also going to see changes with, we're talking about here, women, African Americans, American Indians, and Mexican Americans. And what we see is that, you know, a lot of the times they're going to be short sighted. Nothing surprising there. But um, if we take, uh, if we look through the lens of African Americans, what we need to think about here is that we're starting to see with FDR as well is that he's starting to um, be the, he's starting to, to, to look for the social welfare of the lower classes. But then why is he sliding African Americans? This seems like a great opportunity that would that would be a, a great opportunity could open up here to endorse civil rights. And while he does do some things, okay, to, to endorse civil rights, most notably under his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, where we see African-Americans were appointed to middle level uh, positions in federal departments um, with the work of the first lady. And she's also going to change the role of the first lady in, into becoming more active in, in um, social projects. But why? Why is he not fighting for full-fledged um, integration and, and, and civil rights? Well, he's still a Democrat. So while the Democrats, there's, there, there's a split in the Democrats, you, almost reminiscent of the 1850s, 1860s, Northern Democrats versus the Southern Democrats, um, where the, they, FDR knows that he needs the South. He needs those Southern votes um, to push his new deal through, and, and also he needs those Southern votes for re-election. But um, he knows that if he starts really pressing for 
uh, civil liberties and 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 to end Jim Crow, he's going to lose the Democrats. And eventually, in 1964, LBJ will lose the Democrats in the South. So LB, uh, excuse me, FDR is is floating a fine line here of civil rights and and um, and and keeping the South vote. But he knows that the South needs him as well. The South needs New Deal programs. They need the TVA. They need the CCC to, to modernize the South and, and to bring jobs into some of these extremely poor Southern communities. So they're compromising. They're compromising back and forth. They know that they have to give a little bit when it comes to African-American rights. Um, and FDR knows that he can't take too much for from that. Um, and that'll all change once, once we get to World War II. Uh, you're also going to see with uh, American Indians, you're going to see the Indian Reorganization or the Wheeler Act in 1934. And this is going to be a big, big um, piece of American Indian policy during the time period. It's going to be dubbed the American Indian, uh, the Indian New Deal, where they're going to finally repeal the Dawes Act of 1887. Remember that Dawes Act that that um, really destroyed American Indian culture by breaking up um, Indian family or uh, Indian tribal living and, and the whole sense of Indian culture. Well, now they're going to repeal that and um, they're going to replace it with the Indian Reorganization Act. Uh, and this is coming from AMSCO. The new measure returned lands to the control of the tribes and supported preservation of Indian culture. Despite this major reform, of course, we're going to see critics later accuse the New Deal of being paternalistic and withholding control from American Indians. So that same, you know, we're still that paternalistic idea, American paternalism, white man's burden, whatever we want to call it, is still alive and well during this time period, but it's a start in the right direction. So what we're going to see is we're starting to move towards civil rights, African Americans, American Indians, um, um, Mexican Americans, as well as we're going to see uh, women, but it's going to be put on hold. A lot of that being put on hold is going to be as a result of World War II that's going to happen. And we're going to see that resume afterwards with the civil rights movement that's going to encompass all these groups. When we think of the civil rights movement of the late 40s, 50s, and 60s, you know, a lot of the time we just think of African Americans. And yes, that was a major part of it, but still, other parts of it were the American Indian movement of the 1960s and 70s, the feminist movement, the Mexican American movement, um, were all part of this, this, uh, this plight for civil rights. So did the New Deal work? Well, by the 1930s, the economy did improve, but there was no big boom to say the United States was out of the depression. But what FDR did was really give America's Americans hope. It was his smile that helped the United States come out of the depression. It was his rhetoric towards the people that he and the government were there to help. And what we're gonna see is that it's going to take a world war to truly get the United States out of the Great Depression. In closing, what's the takeaway here? Well, F FDR, a revolutionary president, um, and he changed the role of the federal government. Like, well, I would put him on the line with Washington and Lincoln. So like Washington and Lincoln prior, I would argue that FDR was the third revolutionary president, meaning that America before his presidency was different after and it never returned. He changed the role of the American presidency and he changed the role of the American federal government. FDR's de uh, domestic legacy, more than his foreign policy, World War II, which we'll see in the next video, would see the U.S. become a limited welfare state, meaning the New Deal laid the foundation for the federal government to assume some responsibility for the social and economic well-being of its citizens. Remember, this is a complete 180 from Hoover, where Hoover stated that uh, the, the federal government cannot support the people. The New Deal saw America move away from states' rights, although that argument will never die, and promote further expansion of not only the government, but the presidency as well. So, this is Zag's A Push. I hope you enjoyed this video. And it's a little long, but it's broken up into segments. Um, we will catch you next week coming at you with World War II and how that's going to change American foreign policy forever. We'll catch you later. Strive for the five.